Hello, thanks for coming by for this uh, topic on uh, bladder cancer. Um, we're going to be talking about the different uh, causes of bladder cancer, the clinical manifestation, staging, diagnosis, and treatment, as well as we're going to go over uh, some of the details of the uh, more rare types. So first we'll start with the uh, anatomy. So of course we have this uh, bladder, which is kind of like an upside down triangle, and that's connected to ureters, which connects uh, to the kidneys. And of course we have another one on this side as well, which I'll draw real quick. Uh, so the first int interesting thing that we need to discuss when we're talking about bladder cancer is the lining. And this is because the lining of the uh, entire bladder, and that's a urethra real quick. Uh, the lining of the entire bladder is called the uh, transitional cells, also known as urethelial cells. And these are unique uh, to the ure uh, ureter, the bladder, and even the renal pelvis. And so as you'll learn a little bit, the most common uh, cancers will be related to uh, this lining here. And that's because um, when you have something flowing through the uh, ureter and it goes into the bladder, uh, it, it, it gets exposed to these transitional cells. And so if the patient is ingesting uh, any type of carcinogen, it tends to get uh, accumulated and uh, concentrated in this area. And so uh, that's the reason why the most common tumor is the urethelial carcinoma, also known as the transitional cell carcinoma, which is the lining of the uh, urethra and bladder. Also, the other type is the non-urethelial uh, carcinoma, and so there's a few here, but of course, 90% uh, are urethelial carcinomas and only 10% are non-urethelial carcinomas. Uh, within the non-urethelial carcinoma, even though they are minority, uh, they are split into two different types. One is going to be epithelial, and the other is going to be non-epithelial. And of these two, so of course these are 90%, only 10% of total, within this 10%, epithelials are then a further 90%. So as you can see, the non-epithelial is very, very rare. Okay, so further, uh, further classification um, under epithelial is going to be three types. So you can either get the squamous cell carcinoma, the uh, adenocarcinoma, and finally there's the schistosomal, which is related to uh, a parasite called uh, schistosoma hematobium. Now in the non-epithelial, there is a few types here, the sarcoma, carcinocarcinoma, uh, paraganglioma, melanoma, and lymphoma, uh, but these are very rare, uh, and they're actually so rare that we're probably not going to discuss them past this, so just kind of know that they're there. So the, the main ones that you want to think of is the urethelial carcinoma, also known as transitional cell carcinoma, and then the epithelial ones, so squamous, adenocarcinoma, and schistosomal uh, carcinoma. So those are the only ones we're going to be dealing with. So let's first talk about urethelial carcinoma, um, the causes. Uh, primarily, the number one cause is going to be smoking, and this can include uh, secondhand smoking. Of course, that won't be as severe. And why does smoking, again, cause bladder cancer? There's over 60 carcinogens um, in, the, in, in a cigarette, uh, specifically, you know, like the aromatic amines, which are associated with this carcinogen, and the uh, uh, naphthalamine, which is also another carcinogen. And these, you know, when the patient inhales the smoke, it goes into the blood. Eventually, it'll make its way to the kidney, where it gets concentrated into the uh, urethra and uh, bladder, and that's where you get this type of uh, cancers. Um, Otherwise, there's a lot of occupational risks that are, are, that are involved with uh, bladder cancer. Uh, in particular, uh, metal workers, uh, because of the stuff that the things, that things are dealing with, painters because of the paints, uh, people in the rubber industry, or even in the leather industry as well, uh, people who are in the electrical industry, miners, and uh, you know, people involved in carpet, paints, and plastic, and specifically manufacturing them. And that's again because they get exposed to these toxins which eventually make it, uh, their way to the bladder. Uh, another occupation is going to be uh, firefighters. Let me see here. Okay, firefighters. Uh, and that's because aftermath of a fire, uh, there's so much smoke and soot and all types of stuff in the air. And they inhale this and so this can uh, lead, to be, lead to one risk factor. Uh, there also, there's also some uh, environmental uh, factors such as arsenic, which is sometimes found in uh, the water supply, uh, chlorinated water, uh, th there is some evidence showing it, even though it's a little weak, and also patients who have decreased fluid intake, 
And the idea is people who don't drink enough water, then it can lead to higher concentration of carcinogens. So it can add to that effect. Uh, also patients with chronic cystitis, and this is just you know, most likely due to chronic damage and repair, which can increase the risk of uh, mitos, uh, mitotic errors. Uh, chronic indwelling catheters is another one. Again, it can ca it cause irritation to the uh, epithelium and that can lead to damage. Uh, final, finally, there are some iatrogenic causes, so causes by doctors. Uh, first is going to be radiation. So exposure radiation usually due to cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, prostate, and even testicular. So patients who have a history of radiation exposure due to these cancers are at risk. Uh, cyclophosphamide, which is an, um, another uh, anti-tumor drug which causes hemorrhagic cystitis. Phenacetin, which is not given much anymore uh, as an analgesic is associated. And there is some evidence linking thiazolidine diones, which is a uh, diabetic drug. So these are the overall causes. It's, there's a lot, but pretty much the underlying issue is either they're exposed to some carcinogens or there's some type of uh, chronic uh, damages going on or they get exposed to some drugs or radiation. So let's uh, now focus on the clinical aspect. Uh, one of the main findings that you will find is hematuria, voiding, or some sort of pain. Uh, so these are your three main symptoms which are associated with uh, bladder cancer. However, they will have some general constitutional symptoms uh, such as fever, uh, weight loss, and anorexia. But of course, you know that's common in uh, any tumor that's uh, found. So let's uh, talk about these three main symptoms. Uh, first, uh, hematuria is actually uh, so common that uh, if you have a patient with hematuria and they're 40 years old, then they have uh, bladder cancer until it's ruled out. So if you have a patient over 40, hematuria, you, the first thing you need to do is rule out bladder cancer. And this likelihood increases if it's visible uh, hematuria, so that increases the likelihood that it's associated with bladder cancer. However, microscopic uh, hematuria can also present, uh, be a presenting feature of bladder cancer. The only problem with hematuria is, as you know, there is a uh, high number of differentials. So it could be anything from a UTI to a stone, and those are much, much more common uh, than bladder cancer. So uh, it's very difficult to start, you know, assuming someone has bladder cancer just because of hematuria. And this also points to the fact that women tend to uh, get diagnosed much later because, you know, UTI is more of a problem with them than men. And so they tend to get diagnosed and treated much later, which does have negative uh, prognosis factors. Uh, so there's different types of hematuria, and that can help you figure out which type of, or where the problem is. Uh, if there is uh, hematuria between voiding, um, then that probably means probably some problem with the urethral meatus. And these will also have like bloodstained underwear as well. Um, if you have hematuria at the beginning, it uh, probably means it's a urethral cause. However, if you have hematuria at the end, then that probably means it's a problem in the bladder neck or in the prostatic urethra. So in the urethra, but a little bit higher or up into the, uh, the bladder neck. However, if it's throughout the entire uh, stream, then it can be anywhere in the uh, urinary tract. Uh, so that's pretty much here, hematuria there. Uh, voiding. Um, voiding happens, you know, you have, you have something related to voiding, and this is generally due to the fact that the t as the tumor is growing, you have a decreased bladder capacity. Also, uh, this can be due to detrusor overactivity, so it gets uh, just constantly contracting or some other issue going on. And also, the tumor can invade the bladder neck or the trigone, and so this can lead to some sort of obstruction. And so, primarily voiding, you get two types of symptoms, which is similar to like prostate cancer or BPH. Uh, initially, you can have uh, or you can have irritative symptoms which is like dysuria and urgency, or you can have obstructive symptoms where, where you have decreased urination, uh, and this can be presenting as straining, uh, it can be as intermittent flow, uh, and even it can present as a poor stream. So those are your uh, voiding symptoms. Pain um, locally can suggest advanced or metastatic disease. So if they have pain in that area, it it's, suggests a poor prognosis. If they have flank pain, then it probably suggests that maybe there's some type of obstruction of the ureter. Um, suprapubic probably means it's very locally advanced. Um, it's, it's growing really, really large, or maybe it's even go, going extending into other tissues. 
Um, if they have pain in the hypogastric, in the rectal area, or even in the perineal area, then that, that suggests extension. Uh, either extension to the uh, obturator fossa, uh, it could also be extension maybe in the pararectal area, specifically the fat. Um, it could even get, get, gotten involved of the presacral nerve, which can cause all these symptoms, or you know, much lower the urogenital diaphragm, which will present as the uh, perineal uh, type of problem there. Um, if they have abdominal or right upper quadrant pain, the problem means there's some lymph node involvement or maybe metastasis to the liver. So that's what you'd be thinking of. Uh, if there's bone pain, then you obviously won't think of metastasis to the bone. And finally, if they have a headache, this can suggest some type of uh, leptomeningeal or intracranial uh, spread. So um, that's the clinical features. Next, we'll talk about how you would work up a patient. Uh, first, you want to start with an exam. This would be a digital rectal exam on a male uh, or a bimanual exam of the vagina and rectina, a rectum uh, of a female. After that, you, know, you want to probably do some investigations. The first investigation you want to do is urine analysis. Uh, and what you're primarily looking for is the hematuria. So they should have more than three RBC per high power field. Now, what this can also do is you can try to rule out maybe some, you know, glomerular cause or, or anything like that. So in order to uh, continue to maintain that this is bladder cancer, there should be no RBC cast or acanthocytes. And acanthocytes are just abnormal red blood cells. So if you see any of those two, then it kind of rules out uh, bladder cancer as you know, the cause of the hematuria. However, uh, if they do have the uh, RBC, uh, the, the next study you want to do is cystoscopy. And cystoscopy is where you pretty much put a camera through the urethra and up into the bladder and just take a look. Um, this is the gold standard for diagnosis and staging. So this is definitely the first initial treatment you want to do and it is the best, sorry not treatment, investigation you want to do and it's the best. And what's also nice about this is cystoscopy can also, you can also biopsy and even um, resect the specimen and take a look. Uh, urine cytology, what you do is you take the urine, you look for uh, malignant cells. However, this does have a low sensitivity, so uh, cystoscopy is still a little bit better. Uh, there, are, there have been developed some uh, urine-based urine biomarkers, uh, and this is, can be anywhere from telomerase, and there's a few others. However, this is not that helpful because of the fact that the low sensitivity, um, and so again, cystoscopy is going to be your number one uh, thing there. So you, do, you might want to do some imaging. Uh, so there's different types of imaging you can do. Uh, the first one is going to be intravenous pyelography, but this has been re replaced by the CT, so you only do this if a CT is not available. Uh, next is going to be CT and MRI. These are pretty helpful in determining the location and the extent of the tumor. What's also nice is you can also check for node involvement, and you can also see if it's extended you know, outside of the bladder. So this gives you a lot of information. The only downside is uh, it can miss tumors which are less than one centimeter, especially if they're located in the dome and trigone. And this is when, you know, intravenous pyelography can help a little bit more because the, the fluid, the, the, not the fluid, but the contrast as it goes through there uh, will light up a little bit better. Uh, ultrasound, you can help find hydronephrosis, so upper respiratory tract. And you may consider doing a chest x-ray or radionuclide bone scan. And of course, both of these will be primarily to define any metastasis. So these are different investigations. Now what we'll do is we'll uh, focus on attention on how we stage it. So it undergoes uh, TNM staging, as you're probably familiar with. Um, T is obviously the size of the actual tumor. Uh, if it's T0, that means there's no tumor. Uh, T1 means it has gotten to the connective tissue. And so actually what we'll do first is we'll kind of go over the histology of the bladder wall. Uh, the first layer that you have is the epithelium. And right below that is the connective tissue. Below the connective tissue, we have um, a muscular layer, which is divided into two. Uh, and the uh, area up above here is the inner muscular layer, and the area below here is the outer muscular layer. Um, and then we have uh, paravesicular fat. And uh, so that, that's the actual uh, histology of the bladder wall. So T1 suggests it's gonna be connective tissue involvement. T2A 
is going to be, it's, it's, it's invaded the muscle, however, it's in the inner part. And T2B means invest, invaded the muscle, however, it's in the outer part. Um, then you have T3A and B, which means it's in the actual fat. 3A means you can only see it under a microscope, and 3B means you can just visibly see it. And finally, T4 means it's outside of the fat. So let's just write this down real quick. Uh, so two, 2A is muscle, the inner part. 2B is muscle, outer part. T3A is going to be fat on the microscopic level. T3B is fat on the macroscopic level. And then T4 means it invaded into the prostate uh, or seminal vesicle in the case of a male or the uterus, cervix, and vagina in the case of a female. And um, it can also go into the pelvic wall. Now this... This T staging system uh, is divided into two groups um, based on the muscle. Actually, sorry, not there, but before it goes to the muscle. So between uh, T1 and T2A, uh, anything below that, we call it muscle invas invasive. And above that, we call it non-muscle invasive. And this is important for the treatment as we'll go into a little bit. So that is your T, which is again about the size and invasion of the actual tumor. N is for the lymph node metastasis. Uh, N0 means there's no lymph node metastasis involved. N1 means there's only one lymph node involved. N2, multiple lymph nodes involved, however, they're within the pelvis. And M3 is they've uh, gone into the common iliac lymph node, and so that's the worst uh, staging there. Uh, uh, M is for metastasis, so just to M0 means there's no metastasis, and M1 means there's distant metastasis. So this is how it's staged, and again, depending on how it's staged, it does uh, influence management. And so with that, we'll go over and we'll start talking about management. Um, first, we'll, we'll talk about the management for uh, transition cell carcinoma. So these are broken down into whether it's non-muscle invasive, so T0, T1, or muscle invasive, so T2 and above. So um, the interesting thing with non-muscle invasive is you can do a specific type of treatment called transurethral resection of bladder tumor or TURBT. Um, what, what this involves is actually going through the urethra and actually carving out the and removing the uh, tumor. This can only happen if it hasn't invaded the muscle yet because if it's invaded the muscle it's too deep in there you can't resect it through the urethra. And generally what they'll do is as soon as they do this uh, they will inject a uh, single um, So typically what they'll try to do as well is they'll try to add a single uh, chemotherapy agent within a few hours after doing the... Uh, uh, but besides that, um, what they can also do is uh, intravesical uh, therapy. And so this is uh, chemotherapy. However, what they'll use is they'll use a high molecular weight uh, agent, which... And this is nice because then it's not going to be absorbed into the uh, bladder wall and then so it, it limits the amount of systemic symptoms that they might get uh, and this is generally done one to two weeks post resection and the agent that they use is bcg they I've also can use mitomycin doxorubicin or even gemcitabine so these are the common uh, therapies that are used when they do intravesical uh, therapy uh, finally they can also do a cystectomy which is removal of bladder and they'll do this if it's high grade or if it's severe symptoms which isn't uh, getting better with treatment. For the muscle invasive, you cannot do the transurethral resection of bladder tumor because it's invading the muscle and it's too hard to pull out. So generally what they'll do is they'll do chemotherapy. Um, the agent of choice is cisplatin and that's because a lot of them are cisplatin sensitive. And if they don't show response to cisplatin, then that's generally a poor prognosis. Uh, these tumors tend to be much more uh, malignant and, and uh, aggressive. Um, if that doesn't work or you know it's really aggressive, then they can do something called a radical cystectomy. And this means you remove the bladder, uh, but you move much more as well. So in men, this includes removing the prostate and the seminal vesicles. And in women, this includes removing the uterus, cervix, uh, ovaries and vagina, so you're removing much more than just the bladder in that case. Um, so these are these are the ways these uh, the muscle and non-muscle invasive are treated. Uh, now, if there is metastasis, generally a poor prognosis, less than three years, 
Um, and you, what you just do is chemotherapy, cisplatin, and you know, some combination of other uh, chemotherapeutic agents. So um, this is pretty much you know, with regards to urothelial uh, cell tumors or transitional cell tumors. Uh, what we'll do now is we'll change our attention to um, non-urethral tumors. So, so let's uh, start here. So non-urothelial uh, uh, tumors. So um, there, there's two types, epithelial, which we're going to talk about, and non-epithelial, which we're not going to talk about. And I've kind of mentioned earlier uh, the different types uh, when we're talking about the different classifications. So in uh, epithelial, which we're going to look at right now, there's three types. Uh, the first is going to be the squamous cell carcinoma, uh, the adenocarcinoma, and the schistosomiasis. So these are re relatively rare, rare um, again, only uh, occurring in about 10%. And so what we'll do is we'll talk about these, just some highlighting some features, but we'll go into them too much. So um, with squamous cell carcinoma, there are some risk factors which are unique, uh, primarily the uh, chronic or recurrent urinary tract infections can can uh, cause squamous cell. So this probably irritates the lining and it eventually leads to squamous cell type of carcinoma. And these generally have the keratin pearls and the intracellular bridges and all that. Um, calculi can also cause it. So uh, chronic renal stones can also do this. Uh, pelvic uh, radiotherapy has also been shown to do this. Some drugs such as BCG and cyclophosphamide. And with cyclophosphamide, specifically if they have hemorrhagic cystitis, that's associated. And just like with transitional cell carcinoma, smoking is a big uh, factor as well uh, in squamous cell carcinoma as well. How do you treat it? Generally what they'll do is they'll do um, pre-op radiotherapy and then they'll do surgery where they remove the bladder. And the pre-op radiotherapy is just used because there's a high rate of recurrence. And so studies have shown that this pre-op radiotherapy can prevent that. Uh, adenocarcinoma, there's a few types. Uh, you can get glandular, uh, colloid, papillary, or even clear cell. And there's even signet ring. And signet ring in particular is associated with a poor prognosis. Uh, so adenocarcinoma is associated with two different, is, is further classified in two different types. Either it's uracle or non-uracle. And so just as a recap, uh, uracle refers to an um, uh, embryological derivative. Uh, the uh, umbilical artery, which becomes umbilical ligament, eventually re gets retained as the uracus or the uracle, uh, which is generally found on top of the bladder. And that's why the uracle uh, type is found on the dome of the bladder. That's the classic uh, area that is found. And what's unique about this is it does secrete mucin. So you can get a unique symptom called mucosuria. And this means mucus is actually found in the urine. Uh, these tend to be um, a little bit more aggressive. Uh, these have a high rate of metastasis. And generally at presentation, you'll already see metastasis there. Uh, Non-uracle is associated with uh, bladder exerphy where the entire you know, bladder is opened up in the, in the abdomen and the, uh, the pubic symphysis. And this, um, rather than metastasizing, it's just much more invasive. So it invades the muscle much more quicker. Uh, so next we'll look at uh, schistosomiasis. Uh, schistosomiasis hematobium is a parasite which is associated with uh, bladder cancer specifically. And this can actually cause squamous cell carcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma, or adenocarcinoma, or even a mix of, the, of, of those few. So uh, very unique in that it's an actual parasite causing a tumor. Um, and one unique feature about this is on x-ray, you can actually see calcification of the bladder and the distal ure uh, ureter. So that's a very interesting finding that you'll find there. So these are the non-urothelial. -ure um, so before I wrap up, uh, I'll just kind of mention two other types of common cancers. Uh, the, the other one being small cell carcinoma. Uh, which is primarily seen in the lungs, but you can definitely get it in the bladder, even though it's very rare. And this is a neuroendocrine uh, tumor, uh, which is rarely found. The, uh, the, other, the next one we're going to talk about is uh, metastatic. So, the, so there are some tumors which do metastasize to the, to the bladder. Uh, this actually can be due to an extension uh, from a colon, rectal, prostate, or cervical cancer, or Less frequently, it can be actually due to a distant metastasis, such as from a melanoma, from a stomach cancer, uh, breast, or lung cancer as well. So th this is uh, also found in um, the bladder. And generally, these metastatic ones 
because they usually metastasize hematogenously, they tend to have much more vascular involvement. Uh, so that's generally what would be a classic feature of uh, of a cancer's meta metastasized to the, the bladder. So I hope you learned a lot from that video. I'll see you guys in the future videos. Thanks. Bye-bye.